Let's do some fan questions. Hey, bad guy. It's your old buddy, Aaron. And I have a question for you. I've been watching you since the very beginning, and you promised you would always end with a Chris Lieben story. Where's my Chris Lieben stories? Thanks in advance. Well, it's funny that you should ask that, and I've probably told this one before, and if you've listened to the show and it sounds like you've had, then you've likely heard that one. this one. I don't recall telling this, but I was just in Israel, and somebody asked me for a Chris Lieben story, and I always tell this one because it's my favorite. But Chris one day went water skiing with his uncles. So his uncles are drunk, and the aunt comes along too. But right when they get to the boat, the aunt decides she's just going to stay on the dock and sunbathe. So they get out on the boat, two uncles, Chris, whole bunch of beer. Chris is just a child, whole bunch of beer. Somewhere along the way, and by the way, they don't even have the right equipment. I don't know what they're using to ski behind, but I remember just like some random rope. You know, I don't know if you water ski, but there's an official rope and it's got like a thing, you know, hold on to it. It's got like, you know, colors on it and whatnot. This is just some rope. I'm sure it served the purpose, but Chris added that to the story. And while they're out doing that and uncle's drinking beer, he T-bones another boat. Man and woman are on the boat. They're hurt, particularly the woman. Their boat is ruined. So uncle basically sobers up real fast and just comes clean with them. Hey guys, I have absolutely no insurance. You have every right to call the police and turn me in. But if you will just take me at my word, I will pay you. I will make this right. And I'll get you to shore right now. and We'll get you to the hospital. Okay, great. They all get on board. Uncle's filling his, his name and his phone number and his address out. He's doing everything right. He gives it to the hurt woman. They pull back to the dock where Aunt is sunbathing. Aunt, who's getting half-cocked on Coors Light as well, sits up, sees Uncle helping a woman off the boat, comes over to see what's going on, sees that the woman has the uncle's phone number and name written down, says, that's my husband, bitch, and hits the woman. Hey man, I didn't see you there, bro. Chael, long time fan, mate. My name's Jace. I'm actually the king and the lord of my local UFC chat room, and so I'm sending in this question on behalf of the lads. As you know, UFC team, Dana, they are the best PR in the business. They're the best at marketing, they're freaking geniuses. So do you reckon, before Diaz and Pettis went out for their bout, do you reckon that someone from the team or Dana or whatever sat them down individually and said, hey, if you win this fight, I want you to go and call out Jorge Masvidal and we're going to create a promotion around that and you're going to get a fat mother effing payday. Or do you reckon it just organically happened and they just rolled with it and created something out of nothing, really? Because to me, it all just seems way too good to be true. You know what I'm saying? All right. Now I have to tell you right out of the gate, I love a conspiracy theory as much as anybody, but no, this was completely organic. I mean, first up, it was completely organic. We could stop right there. If we stop right there, we can't have any fun. So let me elaborate for a little bit. First off, could you imagine how hard that would be? Nate Diaz had not fought in three years. So to make believe that he's just going to come rushing back to the table to take on Masvidal would just be a mistake. It was a surprise that he wanted to. Also, don't forget, this is a business. Could be very hard when the boss tells you ahead of time, this is what we want to do. Oh, by the way, when you come to the table to negotiate, it's a little hard for the boss to go, well, you know, I don't really know if that's a good night of biz. Uh, you, th you think we should try that? Huh? I don't know. He can't do that when it was his idea. He has to then cop to the fact that, yeah, this is going to be great. It's going to do really well. So now I, I guess we need to do an addendum. So no, that just simply did not happen. And, uh, you know, the third side of that, I think when you look at that fight and you look how much that all just came together, I've always wondered, too, and we may never have the answer on this, but was Nate planning to call out George Masvidal, or was Nate on a little bit of a high and a little bit of a rush? Oh, and by the way, George just happened to be sitting two rows back. I've always wondered that. Did Nate see George Masvidal, and all of a sudden that light went on, or was he planning to call him out? Because Nate had done an interview before where he brought up George Masvidal out of nowhere, out of nowhere, and he tipped his hat to him. He said, you know, I've been out for a while. I'm watching some of these guys. George Masvidal just went and did his thing. That's a quote. He said, George Masvidal just went and did his thing, which by Nate Diaz speak was meant as a compliment. So George was somewhere on his mind, but I can tell you, no, that was it. not predetermined. It was very organic. What's up, Chilo? I got a question for you. Do you think that if 
Tony got the jump on Habib, that Habib and Conor would still fight, even though there would be no title on the line. And the second part to that question is, do you think that the fight would still be as big, I mean, pay-per-view-wise, as the first fight without a title on the line? Let me know. Thank you. No, no, I don't. Look, that title's very important. And, you know, in all fairness, put yourself in Conor's shoes. How bad would you want to fight a guy? You're doing the same thing at the same weight class with the same guy, but expecting a different result. Oh, and by the way, you got, in Khabib's words, smashed the first time. I think that belt is very relevant. Let me give you and offer you one more example to that. Daniel Cormier and John Jones was the biggest fight that the industry could make. Any promoter, anywhere, and everybody knew it. Dana happens to have the guys, and it happens to be Cormier and Jones. The moment that Cormier lost to Stipe, that dialogue was deader than Dillinger. There is something to the belt. Cormier didn't even want to talk about Jones. He didn't want to talk about 205. He wanted to talk about the title. He wanted to talk about Stipe Miocic. He didn't want to just talk about the division and a big payday. He wanted to talk about the title and Stipe Miocic. And I will say it one more time. The title and Stipe Miocic. So yeah, the belt matters. To your point, if Tony was to get the jump on Khabib, I do believe that the talk would then quickly be Tony Connor by both sides. Tony, I, of course, Tony's going to come after Connor. Well, who's he going to go after? He's going to go after Khabib. He just beat Khabib. I mean, picture this in your head. They're in the ring. Tony's got the belt. Khabib's standing over there, just got beat. He'll call out Khabib. You call out the next biggest thing, which is Connor McGregor. So does that mean they couldn't get matched up down the line? No, but I don't, I'm not interpreting your question that way. I'm interpreting what would be next, not a potential down the road. What would be next? And I, yeah, I think that it would be. Tony and Connor. Chael, how you going, mate? So it's looking like we're going to have a fight between Connor McGregor and Donald Cowboy Cerrone coming up. Now, I've always been a huge fan of Cowboy. He's um, one of my favourite fighters, if not my favourite fighter, just just because he seems like a really good good bloke all around and just is an exciting guy to watch. Um, but I feel like if he does win this fight with McGregor, he may, you know, he'll get a huge payday, no doubt, and you know, he may just take that money and ride off into the sunset. You know, good for him, good for him if he does. But I feel like, you know, if McGregor wins, you know, it sort of can set him back on his road to redemption, and he can sort of, um, you know, move on to bigger and better things like other fighters, uh, whoever it may be, Ferguson, Khabib, Gaethje. I just feel like, it, even though, you know, I love Cowboy, I want to see him win, I feel like it would be better for the sport and better for the UFC if uh, McGregor won. So I'm a little torn on who to go for, but I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the subject. Thanks, mate. I hear your point on that. I hear your point, and they're both very good for business. If you're trying to argue that Connor could be better for business, you would have numbers to support that, though Cowboy has been nothing less than a main event, and those buildings have been absolutely packed. I mean, look. Are we sliding Donald Car uh, Cerrone here? Do you know how many guys in the back of the roster would do anything to be the stars that Cowboy Cerrone is? So I don't think anybody's getting insulted, but I hear your point on that. I will tell you this as far as where does Connor go should he beat Cowboy? And I am very, very bearish on the idea that Connor comes back for a one and done, gets done with Cowboy and rides off on the sunset. And here's why I tell you that. You can say anything you want about Conor McGregor. I'll let it go. It's fair game. You can love him or you can be a hater. Fair game. But Conor McGregor is a man of his word. If he says he's going to fight, he is going to fight. If he says, I'm going to fight this person, he goes and fights that person. If he says, I'm fighting on this date, he fights on that date. No excuses, no matter what. And you can change any one of those variables you want. Conor will honor the entire thing. Anybody you want to bring in there. He's done it many times. Go see the Chad Mendes fight just by example. Go see Nate Diaz part one. Two weight classes separated just by example. He does what he says he'll do. So imagine Connor gets the, the step on Cowboy. Connor grabs a microphone. Don't you imagine Connor is going to use that opportunity like the smart guy that he is to call out somebody else once he does that? He kind of stuck, isn't he? I mean, by his own code of being a man of his word, he'd kind of be stuck. If you talk about if Cowboy beats Connor, where does Cowboy go? I think that could put Cowboy in one of these very rare, very rare positions. And I don't know what to call it. We need, we need to come up with a word over here, okay, at Bad Guy Inc., to figure out how we're going to call this. But the position I'm speaking of is the one that Nate Diaz lives in. 
where he does not have to be a contender for a championship or even be fighting for a championship and is going to be mega business and is going to be something special. By God, if we have to go rent the world's most famous arena and bring in the rock and make a $50,000 belt to do it, we'll do that because something special is following you. I do believe in this sport. When you fight somebody who has something, you take it all. It's winner take all. The Olympics aren't that way, by example. The Super Bowl is not that way. The NBA championship is not that way. If you win an Olympic gold medal and you go out and you lose a contest two months later, he doesn't get to become Olympic champion. You're still the Olympic champion. He just won that event. In this sport, whatever you bring in is on the line. The reason I offer you that scenario, I do believe George Masvidal now takes that. Maybe they share it, but I do believe it now transfers to George Masvidal, where George can go in any direction he wants. It does not need to be the winner of Colby versus Camaro. It just doesn't. It may be, but it doesn't have to be. And I would suggest for you that if Donald gets over on Connor, that then Donald enters that extremely rare club, which in many ways, Cowboy's already part of, right? Cowboy is royalty in this space. I sense that you know that. But I hang out with Cowboy outside of the sport. I see the way he gets treated by fans. I see the way that people know him in different countries. This guy, I'm telling you, this guy transcends the sport. He gets treated like royalty. It went over Connor. Is only going to exemplify that. How are you doing, Uncle Chill? My name's Shahzan, massive fan from Pakistan. So I was actually just watching this interview of yours. Of course, memory lane, old times sake. Uh, and it got me thinking, of course, as a fighter, especially as a fighter of your magnitude, the amount of fans and whatnot you had, you had to deal with a lot of media, whether it be press junkets or press conferences, whatever it is. What to you is the most annoying aspect of the whole media process and uh, how it's treated? Is it the pressure you get from fans or is it maybe the ignorance of some interviews like, of course, Dan Le Batard? Love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. In large part, I'm on the other side of the tracks on this one. I loved the media. I loved the process. I loved the, the questions and the answers and getting people riled up and they're trying to manipulate me, but they're three steps behind and I'm manipulating them back. I love the whole thing. I will tell you, it was a surprise to me, largely to a disappointing uh, perspective. When the media would ask me a question, say, well, you said, and then they would quote me, but they'd be misquoting me. And I hadn't said that. And the reason that that bothered me is sometimes they would say things that were very bad. And I, I played a very intelligent game and I knew right where I was and I never stepped anywhere I didn't mean to step ever. But they would change my words at times to say, I wanted a gun. And I was insulted from an intelligent standpoint. But I, not only did I not say, I wanted to say it. I could even tell you why I wouldn't have said it and why I said what I did say. But I'm a sophisticated thinker and you're a simpleton. And it would be very frustrating. Another thing I would do with the media is you, you'd you give them quotes, straight up interview where they have a microphone. You would then read the interview later. It's just not what you said. That part was a little bit frustrating and disappointing to use your word, but uh, that was a very small piece of the pie. 1%, 2% of the pie. 98, 99%. I loved it. Hey, Chael. Big fan. I also used to be a big fan of Ben Askren, but lately he's been really taking a beating. Uh, it makes me wonder, you know, I can't help but feel like he could be working harder, uh, given his dad bought and all. Don't you think that strength training and losing some of that extra body fat and the gut um, that might be slowing him down could give him an edge, especially when he's performing at the highest levels of the sport? He should be trying to get an edge anywhere he can. Do you think Ben Askren's slacking or are his skills in uh, wrestling and grappling just so good that he can let all of those other things take a back seat? What's your take on this, Chael? Okay, so I, I really feel there's a lot to it. First off, as far as his training, you got to just take it from me. He just has one of those bodies. He trains super hard. Guys will do things to look even better. They'll shave their body. They'll go take tanning lessons right at the local tanning parlor to look a little different. Ben just walks out there, regular guy, and he's happy to do so. But as far as him training extremely hard and being in shape, he, he is and he is to the highest of levels. Let me give you a couple of numbers. These numbers will put some things in perspective. In 2008, when Ben Askren made the Olympic team, he made that at 163 pounds. He was only 23 years old. Relevance being how many of us that are no longer 23 weigh what we weighed when we were, were 23. 
Now, I realize he's not fighting at 163. He's fighting at 170. But those seven pounds, I mean, it's, it's the nearest weight class up before you have to go down to 155. And I think none of us could weigh eight pounds less than we did when we were 23. It's just not really a rea reality of life. So I think he's a guy that stayed in great shape. He also was never, you know, he used to fight at 185, and so many people don't realize that. When he was in Japan, he was actually the middleweight champion. So many people don't know that. So he was a world champion in Bellator at 170, world champion in 1FC at 185. Now he's come back to 170. His body looks the way his body looks. That's true. He's also not a guy that's trying to get around any rules with USADA. And there's not everybody that that can be said for. Hey, Uncle Cho. So only a few months ago after UFC 239, on the post show when you were interviewing Jorge Masvidal, you asked him about fighting his friend Colby Covington. At that time, he said, you know, he didn't want to turn his hand or his knee into a weapon against one of his good friends, but he would fight anyone for the title. Now, in recent reports, both men have said the beef stems back to over a year ago. So I'm wondering if, you know, if the beef's been going on for that long, then how come they appeared cordial and friendly with each other only a few months ago? Hey, your timeline is spot on, and I've picked up on that too. I don't know, but let me guess for you, and I'm probably right on this. Something happened a year ago, but they tried to look the other way. They tried to put it behind them, and everybody moved on like it was cool in the gang, and all of a sudden, it blew over at some point. So whatever that tipping point was, which I think is a little closer to four to five months ago, they said, well, you know what? I was actually pissed at you you know, since January. And the other one goes, well, I was pissed at you since January too. I think it was something more along those lines. I don't have that story. I've never had that story. I've even tried to find it out. I've asked, I've never asked George directly and I've never asked Colby directly. I have asked people that are close to George and people that are close, uh, close to Colby. I don't know what happened there. I really don't. Something happened larger than just we're in the same division and we're both on fire. Something Larger than that, I don't know what it is. Chael, uh, sometimes you say, like, oh, that guy has it all. Good looks, you mentioned. And uh, I'm always wondering, it's like, what does good looks, besides from the marketing perspective, have to do with fighting ability? All right, thanks. Oh, yeah, well, um, nothing. It has nothing to do. It's purely from the marketing perspective. A lot of times, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head that I could use from you. Uh, Oscar De La Hoya comes to mind. Right, you guys remember in 1992, he won the Olympics in Barcelona. If you win the Olympics in boxing, you automatically get a move into the professional ranks. They will license you, and you get a top 10 world ranking instantly. I don't know if you guys knew that. If you win the Olympics, any weight class, and you go professional, you move into the top 10. And that's one of the things they would say about Oscar. You know, not only his multiple heritage and growing up in uh, East LA and the backstory that he had going on to become an Olympic hero and some of these things, losing his mother. I mean, there was a lot of marketability between Oscar, but one of the things was he was very handsome guy. So when you bring up, what does that have to do with your fighting ability? I could only simply answer and tell you nothing. His cross is like a freight train. He moves just like a dancer. Before you ask a question, he already knows the answer. Never lost, he cannot fail And that's the facts of Uncle Jail Say okay, great, to far and wide You're welcome, here he comes